Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to continue our review of functions and we're going to look at how to build new functions from old functions. By old functions I just mean the functions we looked at last lecture. The basic collection of functions which consisted of linear functions, uh, power functions, polynomials, rational functions, and trigonometric functions. From that basic collection we're going to see how we can build up new functions, perhaps more complicated functions, from them. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to do it in two ways. We're going to either take a function and transform it in some way, so we're going to look at transformations, or we're going to take two or more functions and combine them in some way using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, so some algebraic operation, or through composition. So I've split this video up into two parts. The first part we're going to look at transformations, the second part we're going to look at combinations of functions involving arithmetic operations or composition. So let's get started with this first example. Sketch the graphs of these three functions, y equals x squared plus 2, y equals x minus 1 squared, and y equals x minus 1 squared plus 2. So these should be pretty familiar to you. They are all coming from the power function y equals x squared. So if we start with the graph of this one first, then it's just our good old friend, the parabola, whose vertex is at the origin. So there's our parabola vertex at 0, 0. What's our next one? Well, our next function is y equals x squared plus 2. So what this is doing is it's taking all the points that we originally had on our first function, y equals x squared, and it's saying now before, when you throw an x value in, now before you return the output from the original function, add 2 to it, and that becomes the output of our new function. So it means that all our points of our original function now get shifted up to become points on our new function. They get shifted up 2 units. And so our vertex is now at 0, 2. What about the next one? So this is y equals x minus 1 all squared. So what is this saying? Well, again, it's coming from our original function. And it's saying, OK, now take an input. From the original function, you threw your input in, you squared it, and out came your output. Now we're going to take our input, we're going to throw it in. And before we do the squaring, we're going to take one away from it and then we're going to square it. So that means things like, well, what corresponds to the vertex on our new graph? Well, the vertex had an x-coordinate of 0, and it produced a y-coordinate of 0. So we're going to look at this one and say, well, what value of x produces a y-coordinate of 0? Well, when I plug x equals 1 in, 1 minus 1 becomes 0. Squaring that, that produces our y-value of 0. So the value x equals 1 now corresponds to our vertex of our parabola. So that's 1, 0. And then our parabola opens up from there. So this was a shift to the right of one unit of our original graph. If you're still a little bit, maybe slightly confused why this shift happens, maybe you remember it as a rule from transformations, but you were never quite sure why it worked, why the shift happened to the right, even though we had a minus 1. Um, we're going to actually go through that in a little bit more detail in a moment when we start to formalize these, these transformation properties. But for right now, I'm just using this example as a very brief review. So again, let's look at the next example. y equals x minus 1 all squared plus 2. Well, we can think of it as now this function is obtained from our previous one in green, the x minus 1 squared one, and then we're adding 2 to the outputs produced by this function before they become the outputs of our new function. So we're taking all of the points on our green graph over here, the last one we just did, and we're shifting them up 2 units. So again, we're over here at 1, and we've been shifted up 2 units, and there is our vertex, and our parabola is opening upwards. From there, our vertex now is at 1, 2. So now let's look at the graph of an arbitrary quadratic function. 
So our last example indicated that if we could write this quadratic in the form y is equal to some constant perhaps times x minus some constant all squared plus another constant. So if we can write it in the form of a perfect square with some perhaps constant multiple and adding a constant to it, then we can immediately see what the graph looks like. It would be a parabola, shifted b units, either left or right, depending on whether b is uh, negative or positive. Be shifted up or down, depending on the sign of c. And it would be scaled vertically, depending on a. So this would tell us vertical scaling. This would tell us our horizontal shift. And this C would tell us if we have a vertical shift of the original power function x squared. So our, that's our goal. Write it in this form. See if we can do that. So let's go ahead and try. y is equal to 3x squared minus 6x plus 1. So what I'll do is I'll factor out a 3 first of all from both coefficients of the powers of x. And our goal then is to write this as a perfect square. So I'm just going to jot this down. Don't write this because I'm going to erase it. So I'm going to focus my attention on what's inside here and see if I can write it as a perfect square plus perhaps a constant. So let's go ahead and look at that a little bit more closely. What can I do here? Well, I can notice that that almost looks like a perfect square. If I had a plus 1 there, then that's definitely a perfect square. That's x minus 1 all squared. But I don't have a plus 1 there, so I'm going to insert one. And I can't insert it without changing the expression, so I'm going to insert a plus 1, and I'm also going to insert a minus 1, so I've just put in 0 in a fancy way. Now, I see that this is x minus 1 all squared, minus that 1 I had to insert, plus the 1 that's hanging on on the end. And then I can just expand everything out, expand the 3 through, and then collect all the constants together, and I get a minus 3 plus 1, so that's a minus 2. And so there is a new expression for our original quadratic. This process that we've just done here, this is called, you may remember this, completing the square. And really the whole process boiled down to this point here, that x squared plus ax plus a over 2 all squared is a perfect square. That's x plus a over 2 all squared. Now why have I written it a over 2 and a over 2? I, I could have simplified things by just having a factor of 2 in front of the a as a coefficient of x. Well the reason I wrote it like this is because the point is in our, in our simplifications over here we were faced with an expression like this. x squared plus a constant times x. In this case our constant was negative 2. And I said, well, OK, I can recognize that as a perfect square if I add something to it. If I add something to it, what I add is half of the coefficient of x squared. And so I take half the coefficient of x, which is negative 1, and I square it, and that's what I've added to it. But I can't just add something in the middle of an expression without balancing it out. So I had to subtract 1 as well. But the point was that I knew that at this stage, this thing was a perfect square. And that's what this is telling me over here. So this technique was known as completing the square. Now once we've rewritten the expression for the function, we can immediately see what its graph is now. So now we go ahead and graph it. So what does its graph look like? Well, it's shifted to the right, one unit. It's vertically scaled by a factor of 3, so it's stretched out by a factor of 3. 
and then it's moved down two units. So it's down here, negative two, one, and it's stretched by a factor of three. So how can I indicate its stretch? Well, one way is to just pick another point. I know it's going to be parabola opening up, it should be stretched up or opening much more quickly than just the standard parabola, x squared. So how can I deal with that three? Well, I'll just pick another point. I'll plug x equals zero in, and I get uh, negative one squared, so that's three, three times one, three minus two, that's one. So I know it passes through this point here, and so here's what the graph looks like. And there we go. There's the graph of our parabola. Now one of the nice things we have from the form we got by completing the square is that we can immediately read off what the roots are. Right, the original one I could use the quadratic formula to figure out what the roots are. Or for this one, I can see immediately what the roots are. And just as a side note, the quadratic formula is actually derived by taking an arbitrary polynomial of degree 2 and completing the square on it and seeing what the roots are. So whether you use the quadratic formula on the original expression, or we just look at this expression we got by completing the square and reading off its roots, they really amount to the same thing. So what are the roots? How do we read this off? Well, the roots would be where this is 0. So that means when 3x minus 1 squared minus 2 is 0, or x minus 1 squared is 2 thirds, or when x minus 1 is equal to the square root of 2 thirds plus or minus, or when x is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of 2 thirds. So there is our roots. That means our roots, you can see here, they're equally distributed on either side of the x coordinate of the vertex. So there's one root, 1 plus root 2 over 3, and there's our other one, which is 1 minus root 2 over 3. All right, you can, if you want, use the quadratic formula and check that you get the same result. As I said, the quadratic formula is derived by completing the square for a general polynomial. So you're not doing anything different when you use the quadratic formula on this thing directly or completing the square first and then finding the roots in this way. They, under the hood, they're really the same process. Okay, so let's summarize vertical and horizontal shifts. So we're going to suppose C is positive in all these things below. So to obtain the graph of f of x plus c, what that is, it's a shift of the graph of y equals f of x, c units upwards. So this is a vertical shift of c units up. This would be corresponding to a vertical shift of c units down. What about when we've got the x minus c in the argument of the function? What does that do? Well, that shifts the graph c units to the right. Whereas if it was x plus c in the argument, it would shift it c units to the left. Let's think about this for a second. Let's look at this one. Why is it a shift to the right? So we can think about it this way. If a, b is a point on the graph of f of x is a point is a point on the graph of f then what is a point on the graph of f of x minus c. What point do we know on this one? Well, let's think about it. If a, b is a point on y equals f of x, then that means I know that f of a is equal to b. So I know the function value at a. And I pretend that that's the only thing I know. That's the only value of the function I know, f at a. What could I possibly know about a point on this one? Well, I need this thing in the argument of the function. I'd need that to be equal to a. 
because I only know f of a. So if I took x such that x minus c was equal to a, then I'd be able to work out an output of this. So then I would need to know that a plus c comma what is a point on this? Well, if I took the x coordinate to be a plus c, plugging that in here, I get a plus c minus c. So that would be f of a and the y value I'd know because f of a is b. So then this is a point on this function. So if I know a point on the original function f, then this is the corresponding point that I know on this transformed function. So let's see, what does that look like? On our original function f, if this is a and this is b, so that's the point I know, and that's on f, then what do I know on my new function? Well, I know the point a plus c. So that would be over here somewhere, a plus c, and same height b. And that would be on our f of x minus c. So that means the original point I knew had an x-coordinate a. The point I know on my new function has an x-coordinate of a plus c. So that new point corresponded to the old point shifted c units to the right. So that's where this shifting comes in. I think about what, I, what point I knew on the original one and what point that corresponds to now on my new function.